Okay, so we know why we are all here today. On December 12th, the NFS Just National Family Health Survey 5 released fact sheets for 22 states and union territories in India about nutrition, the status of nutrition outcomes. We found ourselves asking the same question as we seem to be asking for the last two decades. Why is our progress on combating malnutrition in India so patchy? For the next one year, we are keen for you, panelists, for you to help us understand the trends, reflect on the progress or the stagnation, and help us think through the immediate actions required. I would like to keep this discussion rather, um, rather um, amongst us rather than a question and answer, as I said before, uh, between you and, um, and each of you and me. I encourage you to build on each other's points as you respond and from your vantage points, expertise and experience. So with that, I would like to start um, our panelists to contribute. Um, my first um, point for discussion that I would like the panelists to comment is on the uh, your reflections on data trends we are seeing from this phase one of NFHS five states and how do we interpret these trends? Um, while doing so, if you could focus or more on the trends rather than the diagnostics, which we will come to, that will be helpful. Since Purnima and, uh, and, and her team have done uh, quite a bit of data analysis and have presented in various places, I would like to start with uh, Purnima to um, provide some, uh, some background on, on how we should be looking at this data, um, how should we not uh, be looking at this data as well. Uh, Purnima, on to you. Uh, thanks, Anita, and it's really it's really lovely to be in such such good company today. Um, so, how should we look at the data? I, I our team has sort of taken the approach that we should firstly, um, you know, be organized and and apply sort of a framework to how we look at the data. So we said, you know, let's first look at what happens with the outcomes, you know, stunting, anemia, uh, underweight, wasting. Let's then look at what the data is telling us about some of the drivers or the known drivers of these outcomes. We know a lot about what causes uh, poor child growth or what causes anemia. And there is some data on those in the NFHS. So we said, let's take a look at that. Um, and then we said, let's take a look at uh, the interventions, the things that are being put in place to address the different, uh, different drivers. And so I think, um, you know, what we see is um, a very sort of a mixed picture uh, with a broad trend towards stagnation on the outcomes. So if I you know, look at whether you look at child growth outcomes, which include in this case, stunting, wasting and underweight, all of which, all three of which, you know, we talk about them differently, but in essence, they're all just indicators of how children are growing. And so I'd like to, you know, like us also to remember that. Um, so on all of those, what you find is, is um, broad scale stagnation, you know, some, um, worsening in, in some states, um, and then some surprises. So the improvements in uh, reductions in stunting in, in Bihar, I think, are, you know, are, are quite positive and require us to, to look, look deeply. Um, on anemia, we see um, uh, increases in anemia, unfortunately, across almost all population groups, except for pregnant women, where you, know, you don't see the trend quite the same way. Uh, and then, unfortunately, on overweight and obesity, um, what we see is, you know, quite a substantial increase. So, you know, it seems almost like a rightward shift of the distribution of body mass index. So you're seeing declines in underweight among adult women and then increases in overweight on the other side. So I think unless there's something really uh, crazy going on in the data with sort of bimodal distributions, my guess is it's much more just an overall distributional shift to the right you know, which, which tends to happen um, in, in societies. Um, the uh, determinants of, of undernutrition uh, among children and determinants of child growth is where I'll focus the rest of the, the analysis. Um, you know, what we see is sort of um, interesting, positive changes on several aspects of things that we haven't quite seen uh, before. You know, exclusive breastfeeding has improved. Um, Complementary feeding has improved. Unfortunately, early initiation of breastfeeding has really taken a hit. Could be related to you know high increase in cesarean section birth. So there's a lot more analysis to be done there. Um, but I think what's most prominent about those findings is that despite, for example, the small improvements you see 
in things that were previously difficult to move and hadn't moved, like complementary feeding, you're still, re- you know, the levels achieved are still very low. All right. Mm. Um, and and that's something that I think we should not forget, whether it's, you know, when we're looking at these trends, I think we have to look at the direction, the magnitude, and the levels achieved. You know, it's not enough mm-hmm. if something, child feeding changes from 10 to 20% of babies receiving an adequate diet. For me, that still says that 80% of babies are still not getting an adequate diet. So we have to look at all three of those. Um, on coverage, there's been pretty encouraging trends, you know, across the board, I think, uh, the interventions that, you know, we know have been prioritized by uh, various health and nutrition programs. One has seen the coverage of those increase in most of the states and for most of the interventions. And, you know, to me, that is uh, that is a heartening finding because it means that, you know, system strengthening and other efforts that have been made over the last few years to sort of really target a set of interventions are helping to move the needle on the interventions. Um, mm. There's a lot of other questions on, you know, you know why you see the right. stagnation and stunting, et cetera, et cetera, but that we'll come to in the next, um, you know, I guess in the next round of discussion. So let me yeah. just uh, stop there and say, we really have a mixed bag and a lot of things to sort of dig in and, and interpret. Um, mm-hmm in geographical yeah. context as well. Thank you. Thank you. Aryan, would you like to add to that? Yeah, no, in- just some, for, for me, so really some, some big picture reflection. And actually, hmm. you know, what I also like challenging with new data, we start really start looking at the, 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 the little one and two, three percent changes and trying to interpret uh, what that means. And then of course it becomes hmm. quite, 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 challenging because uh, some things tend to go up and other things tend to go down. In many cases, you can't actually explain. Let's, all, let's also be honest about that. I mean, the data says a lot, but also a lot of things the data are, it's very difficult to explain. For me, the big thing is children remain malnourished. Women remain having anemia. Uh, from the CNNS, mm-hmm. of course, that CNNS edits that you know that other micronutrient deficiencies uh, are poor. What really comes out also, and although this looks like there's a, in, in overall some improvements in, in, in diets, and I, look, I was looking at the complementary feeding, the adequate diet uh, indicator, it's still bad. One in seven children, one in eight children has got an adequate diet, which means that seven out of eight children don't have an adequate diet. Um, hmm. So for me, I must admit, yes, and we will be looking at all the trends and changes and try to understand that and... and compare that. Uh, overall, again, as, as, as Purima says, um, at the outcome level, it is to limit the progress at, 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 at the intervention level. Uh, but for me, the big story is not about those micro level changes. The big story is for me, we have a problem and we've had a problem for a long time. And mm. please, please don't get stuck in the data. Don't get stuck in, is this a change? And, and can we explain this two or three or 4% change? To be really honest, I don't care if 40% of the children have got an inadequate diet or have got an adequate diet or 16 or 18. The majority of the kids don't have an adequate diet. So actually programmatically, I know you're going to, we're going to come to that in a moment, but programmatically, the responses do not necessarily change. We come to a bit later because, of course, people are asking, are we doing the right thing? Let's come back to that uh, in, in, in a moment, because one of the next rounds, we look more at the programmatic responses. But for me, the overall message is, yes, of course, we would have loved to see very clear trends, very explainable trends and very positive trends. Good. We don't, that doesn't come out as clearly. And yes, we will do the number crunching, but at the same time, the big picture is clear. Malnutrition has been a problem in India and still is a very, very huge problem. And at the end, it's the diets that matter. Children are not having the right diet. Thanks. Very passionate <laughs> interjection. Thank you so much. I'm going to come about the data and data analysis. You're talking to some hardcore data researchers here. Um, so I'm going to um, ask you to respond to that at, at, towards the end of this conversation. Um, Prashanta, what do you think about this? Uh, how do we look at the data? What are you seeing um, from your end? Yeah, I will quote uh, from Purnima's blog, where in one word we can say that uh, it's like fire alarm. Yeah. And, and fire is 
coming from multiple places uh, and for multiple reasons and i think what was not mentioned for those who are uh, uh, listening to this discussion for the first time that this nfhs data doesn't cover it's not for the entire country so many states data for many states is yet to come so when the mm. fire alarm and if it is coming from your neighbor's house so you better see if uh, you are safe so people in jharkhand and odisha and so we have to wait for our uh, findings to come and it's going to come after the this one year after the covid covid yeah so the question that comes to my mind is of course it might help us in the sense that we will know what has been the impact of covid other thing that comes to my mind is uh, when we will have nfh 6 will it happen all together then these states will have only a shorter period to you know catch up or <laughs> if there is comparison with other states so i mean there it will bring a lot of complexities the other thing that uh, mm-hmm. from this uh, data we uh, we do not know who suffered the most when you look at the trends of the past we had seen it the poorest quintile where the mm-hmm. uh, reduction is to be very slow when mm-hmm. for the richest quintile the reduction mm-hmm. is so who are the people who what happened to the poorest quintile during this period so whether it was right. can we state it was stagnation or things became worse so right the other thing that come to my mind is also looking at if you look at, we when you just quickly look at the sheets that have been shared you see a lot of upward going and downward going uh, lines so the nutrition one has a lot of downward going uh, lines and for the child mortality neonatal mortality and infant infant mortality sheet you see uh, you see also improvement in these cases now yeah. just looking at those uh, upward going or downward going and if you are from a particular state so you get very, you get excited but then the, i think what needs to be seen is from which level and what is the current state just to give yeah. an example we have we see uh, reduction in neonatal mortality infant mortality as well as child mortality but the level remains quite high mm. whereas if you look at and then there are states like so i think why it is worrying is when the rates are high from our our work we have seen in 2 to 3 years of say those are all efficiency trends but even when scaled up to some extent we found that 15 to 20% mm. reduction in child mortality should be easy if the rates are high so in that sense there is a mm. loss of proportion there are states like mm. maharashtra where everything is the same so for the mm. last 5 years no change in child neonatal mortality infant mortality and child mortality and there are states where there have been steady mm. gains also i mean we constantly criticize yeah. like west bengal there is reduction in neonatal mortality infant mortality and child mortality in fact if you compare with maharashtra Uh, Maharashtra used to be uh, uh, West Bengal used to be lower than Maharashtra, and uh, it has reversed. So I don't like this comparison between yeah. states, but it's, it, but it's bound to happen. And then why are certain states which have done so well when you look at nutrition data? So there are a whole lot of things that can be uh, discussed. Right. That's that's important. I think you brought in a couple of really important points on. uh distributional aspects of of uh of these impacts or improvements we are just looking at top level really and um and the averages and we really need to dig uh deeper into who benefited and who did not and all of you brought together about what is the level we are starting from and where what are the current levels as well and that's really important and, uh some states are self, you know coming from a very high it's easier to reduce also therefore but it's still a cause for good news i think <laughs> um and and we are really need some good news in this day and age of uh, covid so uh thank you for that i hope that's uh, that that really sets a nice um idea that you know there is some ups there is some downs improvements have on average have improved in some places um it's a cause for cautious optimism but do not get so carried away because we don't know who won and who lost uh in this and therefore um therefore we need to uh be quite careful how, how about either celebrating too early or also um just saying things are just taken a nose dive overall um so 
So that brings us to the next set of uh, questions, trends. Why, why are we seeing the trends you think we are seeing? Well, I mean, I was quite disappointed uh, as much as I was heartened to see for whatever it is Bihar's progress. I was also disheartened to see, for example, Maharashtra's. And again, I know, Prasanta, you don't like uh, naming names of states, but, but just to anchor the discussion, what's happening? What is the diagnostics around what, what has worked and what has not and what's causing stagnation or progress? Aryan, yes. <laughs> Do you have a sense of why things are, um, why things are improving or stagnating from what you see from the data or the trends, yeah. uh, trends overall? You know, I think uh, I think that two for me, two big things uh, coming out. Uh, first of mm. all, the output I would call outcome or impact indicator, which is nutritional status, anemia, etc., stagnating or worsening yeah. here and there. That's one. Mm. And the other one, as Puna mentioned, actually you see quite a few of the services some improvements and some of the behaviors. You see some directions to improvement. Of course, all of us would love mm -hmm. to associate and to find associations to that. Hey, if you are going to increase. Uh, vitamin A supplementation coverage, or we improve uh, IFA among pregnant women. Uh, is there that relation to, to nutritional status? And yes, that relation is there. It's just that so many other factors as well. And I think that is really what, uh, what if you go to refer to analysis, we have to start digging into further. Overall, we see some, some improvement in coverage services. And I think that probably also explains the, some of the health mm -hmm. indicators, improvements uh, there. Uh, probably even uh, mobility mortality indicators uh, there. Uh, but at the same time, when we look at nutrition, mm -hmm. we also know that nutrition is an outcome of, of so many different things, economy as well, um, many other aspects which, which we have not uh, reported on in, in, this, um, in, 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 this, in this data set. Um, there's another mm -hmm. fact, and I'm just looking at one of the questions from Pradeep uh, on, on trying to understand the wasting data. Yeah, that wasting yeah. Uh, doesn't necessarily always follow the change in stunting. Now, one very simple answer there is, for instance, also in, also in wasting, we know that there's a huge seasonality in wasting data. So uh, if you collect data in one month or you collect data four months later in the same area, you might get huge differences. And the difference being easily plus minus 25% around that, that median. Yeah, so even comparing mm -hmm. waste and wasting between different surveys without taking into account when the data was collected are major, major factors that, that we have to be very, very careful with. Um, I want to believe and hope to believe that, that the improvement of services is because of investments in mm -hmm. government programs, including Portion Abidjan, because I think this is the first data that's telling us a little bit about the first time, the first part of Portion Abidjan, eh? mm -hmm. if you look mm -hmm. at the timing. At um, mm. the same time, we also know there a lot of the services uh, from this data, but also from other systems, data systems, we know that coverage of data, coverage of services remains very low. A very large proportion mm. of the kids who need it the most don't get take-home ration on a frequent mm. basis. They're not being reached with mm. IFA. IFA coverage in children is like very, very low, 10, 15, 20% only. So we know overall coverage, although there might be an improvement, yeah, if the coverage is still from very mm. extremely low to very low or just still low, you're not going to see that impact at the outcome level. Yeah, and again, right. we go to the interpretation later and the action later. For me, the message is don't get discouraged. We're on the right track. Yeah? yeah, don't be discouraged. Don't start going out of the box. Stay in that box. Let's not think too much about the box. Let's start delivering that we promised we would deliver. But there's a long way to go. We are not anywhere close for many of these delivering mm. at 80, 90% of the kids that need it. We're still very, very far from that. Until we reach that, mm -hmm. don't expect too much of your impact uh, for, for nutritional status. Some right. reflections from my side. Thank you so much. And I see Jean Drez on the screen. So welcome, Jean. Um, and hope you caught, you were able to catch your breath. Um, I, I haven't introduced you because you were not here. So I'm going to just, just take uh, a few seconds to do that uh, right now. Um, I think most people probably on this panel know who, who you are. Like um, Jean Drez is an honorary professor at the Delhi School of Economics, and he's a visiting professor at the Department of Economics in Ranchi University. He's a development economist who has been influential 
uh, highly influential in the economic policy making in India. His work includes a vast array of issues, including famine, um, food security, gender equality, maternal and child health and nutrition, just to uh, name a few of his uh, passionate endeavors. Um, his co-authors include Nobel, Nobel, Nobel laureates such as uh, Amartya Sen, with whom he has written uh, on uh, famine, and Angus Deaton, with whom he has written on trends in calorie consumption in India. He studied mathematical economics at the University of Essex and did his PhD in economics at the Indian Statistical Institute in New Delhi. Jean, um, your book, Hunger and Public Action, was actually my first reading when I went to grad school at the Tufts Nutrition School, where I did my doctoral degree. It's no exaggeration that I can draw a straight line to that book and what I do today. Strangely, um, I never met you before, although I've read much of your work, and I'm delighted that I have this opportunity today. Welcome to the panel. Thank you so very since much. <laughs> I, I, I apologize for being late. I really apologize. I had been assured that there would be no problem at all in this place, but actually it's too very complicated. But anyway, uh, we are here now. I no, glad, uh, glad you made it. I would have been disappointed if I didn't meet you once again. So um, thank you. Uh, since you came late, um, um, I think your punishment is to go first after Arya now, uh, which is the, what we're discussing right now is, um, is that we talked about the trends, which I'm sure you know intimately well, so we won't go into that, and I won't try and summarize for you. Uh, but we're trying to understand what are the key reasons behind these patchy trends that we are seeing, some increases in some states and some decreases in some states, um, on various uh, set of indicators that IFPRI and others have worked on and put forth uh, in their slides and blogs. Um, so could you help us understand uh, what some of the reasons for this are in terms of, in terms of this progress or stagnation? That I can try to help, but it's not very easy to understand. There are lo a lot of alarm bells actually at the moment. Uh, mm. There is, of course, the findings of the fifth national family health survey, which I think you must have discussed. So I don't think I need to go over that again. Yeah. Uh, just to say that the dominant pattern basically is of uh, very little change over five years in the, at mm -hmm. least in the child anthropometric indicators. If you take a population weighted average uh, of the uh, underweight proportions or stunting proportions for the 10 major states for which data are available, you find virtually the same figures in uh, 2015, mm -hmm. 2019, 20. So five years without change, which is really quite worrying. I don't think anything like that has happened, at least in India, uh, ever since we started doing this kind of measurements. Um, it's also important to see these figures in uh, perspective, both the perspective of what, happens, what was happening before, which was actually uh, fairly rapid improvement, at least by India's standards, uh, in the 10 years that preceded NFHS4. Uh, it's also useful to look at this in comparison with what is happening in other countries and especially in other South Asian countries. And there again, we find reasons for worrying because other countries uh, with the partial exception of Pakistan seem to be progressing faster, including certainly Bangladesh and uh, even Nepal, which are much poorer countries than India and not growing as fast. So there are various kinds of um, Alarm, causes of worry. And uh, there are also alarm bells, uh, not in the field of nutrition, but in related fields. For example, uh, the uh, uh, spike in poverty estimates in 2017-18. Of course, the government disowned the data as, well, as soon as the findings came out, but still it's uh, worrying. And then there's the stagnation of real wages, um, uh, that happened uh, in the last five years. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, uh, more recently, the lockdown and so on. So there are a lot of uh, indications that things are not going well. And that's why when the previous speaker said we are on the right track, I wish I could agree with that. I mean, I share his optimism in the sense that I think in, eventually uh, we will overcome the current situation. But I think to, to say that we are on the right track right now is perhaps not quite correct. Now, coming to your question, I will just mention two things that may help us to understand what is going on. Mm. One is that I really feel that the Indian government has turned its back on children. 
in the last five years. There's been no major initiative in the field of child health and nutrition. And there have been some serious setbacks. The first budget of the NDA government uh, in 2015-16 included uh, massive cuts in child nutrition programs, including ICDS initially a 50% cut, which is extraordinary, and a 36% cut for midday meals. Uh, these cuts were partially reversed later on in the year because they were so extraordinary that even the government's own ministers had to protest in public and say that we are not able to even pay the salaries. Mm -hmm. But it was an interesting signal of how, of what sort of low priority uh, the children were getting. Uh, I should mention, to be fair, that that was a year when there were cuts also in other domains because uh, the uh, share of the state governments in the uh, pool of taxes was raised from 32% to 42%. Uh, mm. So that was invoked as a justification for some cuts, but the cuts were the worst and the largest by far uh, on children's programs, and that has, that has never been explained. In fact, when I talked mm. one year later, about this with the chief economic advisor, he said that uh, they had not really paid much attention to that and it kind of happened, mm -hmm. uh, you know, almost by accident. Uh, mm -hmm. another, another indication that's also quite telling is uh, what the central government has done with maternity benefits. As you uh, know, perhaps uh, under the, the National Food Security Act, which goes back to that 2013, all pregnant women in India are entitled to 6,000 rupees of maternity benefits uh, for all children, uh, 6,000 rupees is not a lot, but it can actually help pregnant women uh, and also after delivery, because this is a time of uh, hardship for many women. Some, uh, sometimes there are big contingencies, you know, high health costs uh, connected with delivery. And also, of course, a time when they need to be able to eat better and to take rest and so on and so forth. So it's not much, but at least the principle of universal maternity entitlements was a very important, if not the most important feature of the National Food Security Act. And yet it was ignored for almost five years and not implemented, not implemented at all uh, by the, the Modi government. And then finally in 2017, a symbolic scheme called Pradhan Mantri Matruva Nanayujna was initiated to implement this provision of the National Food Security Act. But the initiative was ruined by firstly restricting this to one child per woman and then reducing the benefits arbitrarily and against the law from 6,000 rupees to 5,000 rupees. And on top of that, there are a lot of complications in the application process and the payment process and so on and so forth. And the result is that the scheme has not really taken off. Mm -hmm. uh, meanwhile, some states, not only like Tamil Nadu, but even Orissa has, have excellent maternity benefit schemes uh, right. Not just for one child, but for two children. So it could have been a very successful and very useful scheme, but it was kind of ruined uh, just for the sake of saving a little bit of money. It's not not much money at all. It's very little. So these mm -hmm. are just. So I'm just talking of the kinds of signals that gives mm -hmm. this, this gives. Uh, mm -hmm. In concrete terms, it has also translated because the budget was reduced, and they are still today lower in real terms than they were mm -hmm. in 2014. Both the ICDS mm -hmm. and the Midlands. And that has, translated, mm -hmm. that has translated into a decline, according to official data, in the coverage of supplementary nutrition programs. So these are, I think, quite uh, uh, worrying trends. Uh, I'm not saying that they account mm -hmm. for the stagnation pattern that we have seen, but I think they contributed to it. Yeah. And very quickly, I'm sorry yeah. for too long, but I'm catching up since no, I came. That's fine. Uh, no, no, I think you touched on points I was hoping you would touch upon, which is really... Yeah. Um, you know, what are the uh, some of the key determinants are really the economic and livelihood yeah. determinants. Right. So I, I was and just what you're saying is despite improvements in some of the governance aspects under Portion Abhyan or, or whatever it was before Portion that is, is a drop in the ocean. Portion Abhyan is neither, you know, right, right. Uh, you know, yeah, or, or, actually, or sanitation. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. It was a yeah. much more, uh, of course, much more important uh, and, and uh, uh, yeah. 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 and uh, one would expect that to, to help. Uh, so mm -hmm. do you want me to finish or quickly make the second point? So one point is about the lack of commitment to children, which I think is really quite, quite dramatic yeah. at this time. Mm -hmm. And the second one, of course, is the economic slowdown and, and yeah. recession and crisis and so on. And I think it's very possible that this stagnation that we have seen in the nutrition indicators 
reflects the fact that the economic impact of demonetization on the informal sector and the underprivileged is, was much worse than we think because mm. we have never really known how serious that the impact was. There's just hard, there's hardly any data. Mm. Uh, there is some data. There are some estimates of the mm. growth of GDP, mm. which give the impression mm. that things were not still not so bad for the two or three years after demonetization. But these estimates are firstly very unreliable because the entire informal sector is off the statistical radar. And in any case, they don't tell us much about what is happening to poor people. So I think there's a real possibility that they were hit much harder than we think for a long time mm. by the demonetization and what followed. Yeah. And of course, again, this year by the lockdown. Yeah. So in a way, you're saying this narrative that we, that we said maybe in the, until maybe the mid this decade of India shining and economic growth is happening. But so before, when I was working in India last decade and early this decade was, the narrative is that there's a lot of economic growth that GDP is growing leaps and bounds and yet nutrition indicators are not moving. But now that was it not, seems yeah. like even that narrative is, yeah, exactly, I mean, so um, that even that narrative is pulled under from us, it looks like. Mm -hmm. No, before, in the 10 years that preceded NFHS 4, yeah. there was rapid growth. There were also yeah. a number of important initiatives in the social sector, yeah. whether it's yeah. the Food Security Act, the Employment Guarantee Act, the yeah. big expansion, yeah. the huge expansion of ICDS. That was a very big thing yeah. that was under, that was under yeah. pressure yeah. from the Supreme Court, yeah. but mm -hmm. it really turned ICDS into an accepted mm -hmm. facility that people expect mm -hmm. to have in their village and they expect to be function functional. Yeah. So there was both economic growth and social initiatives and the result was, yeah. for the first time, significant progress in India, not very yeah. rapid yeah. by international standards, but quite rapid compared to what it had preceded. And then it's after right. that, in something it seems mm -hmm. to have gone wrong by all the yeah. indications that we have. Yeah. So yeah. We had um, no, 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 that's fine. I was meaning NHFS 3 and around that. And of course, then NHFS 4 provided us some sort of great. We are, I think, moving in the right direction and all of that. And then we are somewhat, the, these findings are quite sobering again. Prashant, I would like to come to you on that, right? So, uh, you know, in this context of uh, much more uh, reduced and people may agree or disagree, since thankfully I'm, we are not on TV or politicians here, you know, uh, we can just say that um, you, Jean's point about, um, you know, we are reducing spending overall and not prioritizing uh, children and mm -hmm. investing in them. Um, there are these, uh, and, there, and as you said, there are quite a lot of inequities. Talk us a little bit about how we are seeing these inequities playing out and what kind of issues are you seeing? For example, for me, it's hard to imagine how we would make any substantial progress without improving the voice of the women and, uh, you know, reducing gender-based violence and, and agency of women. And um, how, what, how are you seeing this planning, you know, working in currently in terms of our progress on those, on those areas? Uh, several things you have asked, but let me, uh, if you just look at the, uh, whatever is available and which is five data, just focus on that. Mm. And my question was, how do we know if, uh, which quintile has benefited mm. how much or the other yeah. way around? We will, mm. not, we will not know right now unless we have more data, but mm. there's one way to look at it. Look at the data of severe wasting. I think it's the poorest children are severely wasted. It's a proxy in some sense. If you mm. look at the social, you know, if you really look at the characteristic of children who suffer from severe wasting, they are from the poorest families, often, often. And some mm. of these high profile states have close to 10% severe wasting. It tells mm. you something. Mm. That trickle down is not working. Mm. Other thing mm. we organize is say hot cook meal even during COVID some we, we just started because I think it's getting too late. Mm. So when mothers come with their babies walking one kilometer for just for a khichdi, you know that things are not good. 
Mm. So coming back to your question about uh, uh, gender-based violence and women's agency, you know, I think during the last mm. our own work in Jharkhand, we had seen that it's structured community capacity building involving uh, women, mm. not women's group per se, but mm. these are gatherings of women where poorest are not excluded. Sometimes self-help groups might exclude the poorest, so everybody mm. is welcome. And these are facilitated mm. by one of their own kind, like the Sahiyas who are doing mm. amazing work, our frontline workers. Just mm. now, astounding reduction in neonatal mortality. You, uh, this uh, paper was published, and I think we were able right. to uh, scale it up. Now, this is being scaled up across the state of Jharkhand, and and we are waiting. It has also been evaluated, and the, it will be published. But it it will be naive to believe that. Just using one meeting every month, we are going to you know bring down undernutrition. So there is a whole lot of you know agencies are working on BCC behavior change communication and expecting that things will somehow anthropometric uh, measurements will improve. Mm -hmm. So we did. So we were aware of it. So we added a number of other components in a number of trials that we did, including one mm -hmm. with you, where we mm -hmm. uh, brought other things like. Uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture, uh, how to improve also okay. nutrition specific ag agriculture practices, etc. And we found that there was improvement in dietary diversity. But this too, to, it's, it's really aspirational to uh, in, think that women's uh, knowledge increasing and yeah. her voice, you know, she will be, her voice will be heard. And things will start changing in the family is again, I think it is uh, expecting too much because mm. there are multiple uh, players people are involved and also yeah. uh, processes as well as materials that is required. So all these so-called behavior change uh, methods that is being used across the country will not give any results unless some material support is provided, be it in form of food or wherever appropriate yeah. cash is provided, which, for example, maternity benefits should not be conditional, but it should be unconditional. And I think it should also be increased with time. We've also seen if yeah. uh, issues like gender-based violence is discussed out in the open. Earlier, we were also quite you know, apprehensive, but we thought that it, we saw that it is possible. It can be discussed. Yeah. So, sometimes, sometimes the yeah. discussions will have to be anonymized and so, you know, but it's possible. Yeah. And you'll be surprised mm -hmm. three years back when uh, women were asked, uh, is it okay to be, you know, uh, abused? 70% of them said it is okay. So it's almost like become like a norm now. So, well, but with time, things yeah. start changing. But people also, somehow people, sh uh, women should also know where mm -hmm. to go if there is a, if there is any violence. And mm. it should also, and it uh, yeah. should be yeah. responded to by the system. I think, I think, I try to co yeah. cover everything. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, I think what you and Jean trying to say, are saying, not even trying to say, is that obviously, you know, these inputs of whether it is just behavior change or whether one micronutrient or whatever needs to have a, a wraparound. Okay. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. comprehensive approach to all these different aspects, whether it's economics and livelihoods, prioritizing and investing in children in different ways, um, uh, looking at distribution time, impacts. If we, have, if we have time later on, I'll mm -hmm. discuss about our experience with creches for children. Yeah, definitely in the next part. I'm coming to that. One yeah. quick, uh, Unima, do you want to add anything? Quest of interpretation, right? And I'm you know, I'm very yeah. much um, aligned with, you know, what Jean, you have, you have said. And, you know, for me, the, it feels like it's what has happened to support families with children and to, to invest in nutrition started uh, too little too late. You know, the fact that uh, it took four years for a nutrition mission to be put in place, despite the fact that I think everyone who worked on nutrition, the technical community outside of the new administration at that point knew, you know, we broadly knew what needed to be to be in place. You know, the the asks 
for uh, high quality nutrition investments, et cetera, were clear. We were all very aligned on it. And yet it took, you know, four years. So March 2018, four years into the administration for the nutrition mission to be announced. Uh, and this has certainly been a period um, in politics where the signals from the very top have, you know, have sent signal priorities. And so sanitation was prioritized in 2014. You see the impacts of that on the sanitation indicators in 2019. Nutrition was prioritized in 2018. Uh, you know, and maybe we are seeing some impacts of that on, you know, the, the changes that Aryan mentioned on coverage and on some, you know, often difficult to move indicators like complementary feeding. Um, but across the board, I mean, there is a necessary but not sufficient frame that we have to keep in mind. I mean, to me, the fact that the children born into the survey were born in the years of 2015 to 2019, uh, were born to families that we know clearly experienced shocks of different kinds. You know, the shock of the demonetization in 2016 was very wide ranging. There was continued economic shocks after that. Um, and, and then if the nutrition programming you know, was prioritized in 2018, and the nutrition, and you know, I, I want to take some blame as well as the nutrition community here, because I think the nutrition community was so happy to get nutrition on the agenda that, um, you know, the, the behavior change aspect of it was very exciting. It was exciting to the government and, you know, the community stood behind it. Uh, but we should have asked for more. The nutrition community should have clearly asked for nutrition sensitive social protection, saying, listen, there have been economic hits on families. We can't just do, you know, ramp up the behavior change and not acknowledge the other things that families need to respond mm -hmm. to behavior change, whether it's the PMMBY cash transfers, expanding those further, you know, really putting in place other forms <clears throat> of nutrition sensitive social protection. So, you know, that's what I would like us to, to look forward to at this point, you know, to say it is not enough to me that we do what was already outlined in Poshan Abhyan. There has to be more that keeps the behavior change in place because we know that's really important that people get the right information uh, on nutrition appropriate behaviors, et cetera, but also brings in what we know families need to respond effectively to behavior change. You know, we know we see the biggest impacts on, you know, on nutrition when we couple uh, the, you know, cash or food transfers with uh, nutrition behavior change. And if we are not going to do that, we are not going to ask for that, then I think we're ignoring the evidence. Um, so that's what I would like to see. But for me, the, the diagnostic is so far too little, too late and necessary, but not sufficient. Thank you for that. I think that brings us to the, uh, the next, next point. One of the things I wanted to just reflect on uh, as Prashanta and actually Audrey Post is also on, on the call working together on OPA1 is as Prashanta was saying, you know, we tend to tell women, you know, Count, do whatever counseling or whatever we want to be target them right as self-help groups or thinking that these women will somehow we'll tell them in some polite fashion hopefully in our trials you know to go talk to your husbands talk to your father-in-law how to grow this how to grow that and that's a big in in a way that's just big assumption that these women have can actually do that and what we find in our process evaluation is yeah they can do it where conditions are already okay and they can't when uh, conditions are not okay in their own households. So how do we move from the way we think about nutrition from various sectors, but also in the way in our mind we think about targeting these interventions? I think um, I think we do know it somehow something uh, gets lost when actually all this is being uh, drawn up somewhere, including our trials or in the policy or something. So on that, I would just like, therefore, to to focus our last part of our conversation for the next week is what are the um, actions needed? And Punima, you started that on what are the actions needed? One is we need to really think about necessary but not sufficient. How do we how do we push for that sufficient condition um, and not go about on too little too late? I mean, we are here. So what is it that we need to ask for? So um, Aryan and 
Jean, Prashant, and Purima back again on that. Yeah. Let, let's first look at the da- at, at use of data. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for me, it comes back to my first point that, uh, yes, there's that trends. Yeah. And, and, and we look at the trends, we learn from the trends, we'll try to interpret the trends. Uh, but NFHS 2, 3, 4, 5 now show that there's a big problem. Um, and I, I'm just wondering what is required to, to get a policy change happening, to get the response change happening. Um, I'm, there's, let's, let's, we often focus on what we don't know. Uh, if you look at the information that is available, there is a lot of data and knowledge about the situation of children and nutrition in the, in the country. And we know quite a bit about how much the programs are reaching or are not reaching uh, women and children. So my big question is really what is going to be, what are going to be the triggers? What are the triggers that are required to get this data being used? And being used is for really for substantial change. Like Purima said that uh, even after the previous, uh, after uh, after NFHS 3, it took quite a bit of time to get then the missions uh, for the state level and then the national mission. So for me, that is something that I keep, keep, trying to understand and, and recognizing that having knowledge, having data apparently does not always lead to action. Actually, I'm wondering if there's a level of panic starting among some of the policymakers and, 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 uh, and program managers. If I look at the newspaper articles and the headlines, it's about malnutrition is not going well in spite of everything, or we need to change the approach. Uh, and I'm a bit worried about that. Um, mm-hmm. If you go to a review from a technical point of view uh, of the policies, the strategies, the schemes that have been designed in, in the country and uh, at state level, they're generally okay. They're generally, from a technical point of view of programming, what we know works at different countries and uh, even parts of India, they're not bad at all. Of course, a bit of tweaking here and there you can do, but overall, the design of the policies, the design of the programs are oh, good. There are very few cows in the world that have got a system like ICDS. Many cows are j- literally that jealous. We wish we had a system, community system like ICDS. We wish that we had all these kinds of social protection schemes, the, the, the funds, the cash schemes, the, the, the feeding schemes, the food schemes. Many cows are jealous. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm a bit worried that that people will take the NFHS five days and say, oh, we're wrong. What else? We need to be creative. We need to be innovative. And I would say, no, don't be creative. Don't be innovative. Don't think out of the box. Get in that box and do the work. The policies mm-hmm. need to be implemented as they were designed. The programs need to be implemented as they were designed. We need for all these policies and programs, we need to focus on reaching all. And all is not the 80%, because the 20% that's not reached, that are the ones that most likely need it most. Mm-hmm. Take vitamin A supplementation. Vitamin A supplementation is to reduce the risk of mortality due to diarrhea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is the most vulnerable kids who need it. And that are the kids that normally are not reached. So 70% coverage of vitamin A is bad, because the most vulnerable are in the remaining 30. Uh, yeah. So we need to reach everyone. We need the quality of the program. We need and only then you can start having impact. So my question is collectively, how are we going to repackage the messaging? Don't mm. get stuck in the details. Don't get stuck thinking that we're doing the wrong thing. Mm. We haven't done the old thing yet. Stay in that box. Let's start implementing the programs as they were supposed to be, as they are designed, as the policies are, as the schemes were designed. So, so some reflection. Yeah, I, I struggled with this. I, I, I totally agree with you. It is I, in fact I have a quote for the really Pulima knows and I can't say it in public on my approach to improvements in oh, okay, well, I mean she already said that. Uh, improvements in nutrition in India because we have so many schemes from you know, cradle to coffin. Um, but one of the things that is maybe I don't know if it's peculiar to India or not, is we think nutrition is ICDS. We just equate these two. Right. ICDS is one program, but we do know uh, to doing a certain number of things. Either we pile up more and more on that and some self-help groups, because now we have self-help groups scaled up. Um, and we approach nutrition as though it is it ha- everything has to be program programmatized in some way as a program. That is again necessary, but in terms of being sufficient, you know, affordable diets. Uh, poverty reduction. Where are we in terms of affordable diets? Are diets affordable? Nutrition, let me, I don't mean rice and wheat, 
uh, but are aff uh, um, diets affordable, nutritious diets affordable, Jean? Do you think uh, children and mothers are able to, what kind of trends do you see there? I think we need to focus on that as well. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, I tend to agree with Ariane that uh, what we need to do is so, not so much to get out of the box as to get into it a little better. I think the title of this webinar is Rethinking Nutrition. And I, I think what we need is not so much rethinking as to uh, as much as acting. And uh, we, we know a lot of things that actually can do a lot of good, but I think they're not being done enough at the moment. I've already given examples like the fact that the maternity benefits, which could have done a lot of good under the National Food Safety Act, are still not being, being implemented to this day. I can give other examples. One very dramatic example is the provision of eggs in midday meals, both in schools and uh, in Anganodis. I mean, we know for a fact mm -hmm. eggs are very nutritious, they're excellent for growing children, they are affordable, they are safe, mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. like them. I mean, it's good in every respect. In many mm -hmm. states in India, uh, the southern states, Orissa, West Bengal, even Jharkhand here, uh, have introduced eggs in Anganodis and in, in Midemis with a lot of success. So we know for a fact that it would be good for that to be a national policy. But yeah. of course, there is a lot of resistance from that, from vegetarian lobbies. Uh, so it's not happening at the moment. Uh, let me mention another, another thing that I think we know we can do, which links a little bit with your question, which is to release mm -hmm. these gigantic food grain stocks that are growing by leaps and bounds year after year now, uh, even through the lockdown. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm. India is now procuring more than 90 million tons of food grain per year and releasing only 60 million tons or so because the requirements of the Food Security Act are around 60 million tons. But procurement has gone up from 60 to 70 to 80 to 90 and may cross 100 million tons this year. And the consequence of that is that enormous food uh, grain stocks are accumulating and are probably going to grow further this year. They've already crossed. 100 million tons in July last year, and quite likely they will go even higher this year. And that doesn't help poor people, of course. I mean, if you procure, then I think you should distribute in good time. If you just procure and you then pile it up, then it's really a criminal undermining of the affordability of food for the poor because yeah. they will be, they will be otherwise. I, I, I realize that more consuming more food grain is not necessarily going to do a lot to improve nutrition. But at least if people are able to afford food grains at a reasonable rate, they will have more money to spare to spend yeah. on more nutritious items. So coming to your question, I think food is too expensive for, expensive for poor people in India. In fact, there is some recent work showing that a large majority of poor people in India cannot afford even a minimally nutritious diet, uh, even at the minimum wage. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so I think we have to try to somehow get out of this uh, over focus on cereals and especially on rice and wheat uh, mm -hmm. as, opposed to, as opposed to more nutritious food grains like millets, which could be promoted and mm. have been promoted, by the way, recently with, with some success in Orissa, uh, included in the PDS, included in mid and uh, so on. So I think we have to try to get away uh, yeah. from that uh, over focus on rice and wheat and uh, mm. diversify uh, agriculture as well as the PDS. I mean, the inclusion yeah. of dal, for example, in the PDS would be quite feasible. In fact, it has been done last year in 2020 during the lockdown period as a relief measure. And that has demonstrated mm. that you can uh, include viruses in the PDS without great difficulty. So I think that would be a very good thing to do from the point of view of mm. nutrition, and it would help to diversify agriculture and it should be very good for the small farmers as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are a lot of things that I think we can do and it's a question of doing them more and better and of putting the funds and the resources, not just the financial resources, but also the political resources, mm -hmm. rather than try to, uh, you know, reinvent the wheel. Thank you. Um, so clearly, um, nutritious, affordable diets are super important and and uh, you know, and taking the larger framework for nutrition uh, to just outside of that ICDS box, because much gets tends to be written about ICDS. So I want to just come to Prasanta in terms of 
um, improving the living conditions and childcare conditions of uh, of children and and therefore their parents as well. So tell us a little bit more about how can we create and sustain um, sustain interventions and endeavors to to actually improve the living conditions uh, for children and uh, and of course anyone in the community, but in this case, I'm, I'm specifying children. You know, one way of say, compensating compensating for the unpaid women's uh, care work yeah. is provision of crest near to their homes. Yeah. If, if say for example thousand rupees is being spent per child in to uh, care in the crest, yeah. seven and about seven hundred rupees you are paying back to the mother in that sense. You know because. This is going to the crash workers' salary for care work. Mm. You start thinking like that, and the mm. rest will go for nutritious meal. But the biggest advantage that we saw for these crashes from six months to three years of age is, mm. and at least at any time we are following up twelve about twelve hundred kids, and regularly anthropometric measurements are being taken. So I can tell you very quickly. Uh, let me just list the kind of activities that happens for every for the viewers also. Starting from a safe environment to smoke-free environment to uh, nutritious meals, hand washing station, and mm. early childhood stimulation, snacks, and a whole lot of mm. things happens. Early childhood stimulation is mm. is easy to deliver in crash than by individual mothers in their homes because kids are also learning from mm. each other. So if you really look at the amount of money that people are spending to send their kids to these play schools, etc., they're already spending so much of money. Mm -hmm. So you are actually reducing that cost also by providing uh, this uh, kind mm -hmm. of care. We have seen in a few months' time, severe acute mm -hmm. malnutrition comes down by 5%. Aryan, please mm -hmm. note this. So this only with good hot cooked meal, additional oil and eggs. Severe acute malnutrition oh. can be treated, and we should not be running after magic remedies. You know, one of the reasons why things have deteriorated is a lot of discussion around magic remedies happened during these five years. Oh. So, so, so oh. some of people started believing that up to malnutrition solve ho jayega. You understand? It really diverted the discussions from what people can do to something will, will be delivered to them. Which is totally alien. So in, nowadays, with take home ration also, I see so at least in that list, ready to use therapeutic food is being mentioned. It is possible to solve the problem, reduce severe acute malnutrition. We've seen it again and again and again. Just to give you the last example, all the kids who were, who were under care in the crashes and the lockdown happened. So when they graduated, when they became three year old, we took their final measurement because now they will go to Anganwadi. So we have for about 1000 kids, we have data when they graduated, what was the status of severe acute malnutrition? They did not get care in crash all throughout these three years. They had probably spent six months to one year in the crashes and the rest of the period they were getting take home ration. A well delivered take home ration like it happens in Odisha. Severe acute malnutrition had come down by 85% when they graduated. So, the preventive way to deal with severe acute malnutrition, I brought SAM because in all nutrition discussions in India, they are only discussing SAM, SAM, SAM. Another point I would like to highlight is we have looked at case fatality and we have published our work. Case fatality of severe acute malnutrition is only 1.1%. It is not 20% as it was being told without any data from India. The case fatality is low. I'm not saying that it will remain so after COVID because we don't know if measles vaccine has right. been given and many other things have happened. So the pathway to survival has changed and somehow the kids are surviving, right. but we don't want them to survive just like that. You know, somehow survive because their cognitive yeah. functions have improved and they have to become healthy. So I will yeah. recommend very strongly that crashes should be become, uh, should be, uh, Government should use public uh, public sector money should be used for crashes and Odisha government has done it based on our data. 
yeah from the work that is happening yeah. in in future now it is part of sopan strategic operational plan for accelerated nutrition all district mineral fund not all district mineral fund will be used because mining areas and you know and malaria and malnutrition are co terminus you will see in many places mm. so all the money that has been accumulated and it's also about, so it's it's also about innovative financing mm-hmm. because district mineral fund is programmed to be used in poor areas mm. people who are affected by mining and that money can be used for nutritional programs and we have shown it and it's not an rct we can't do a randomized control trial half the kids are not getting any food and half the kids are getting you know care in the crashes yeah but yeah. looking at when they are their entry level data and when they are graduating the improvement that we see is it outstanding and just finish by telling one uh, uh, just sharing about one more study five civil society in five districts uh, civil society organization in jharkhand jharkhand and odisha came together and in the areas where they had community mobilization through structured community capacity building meetings home visits and counseling and crashes wasting reduced severe wasting reduced there was a reduction in under uh, underweight obviously and there was a reduction in stunting also there and it is so there is a lot to be learned mm-hmm. from the community based work that is going on in in many uh, thank state, you i mean in chatisgarh madhya pradesh yeah. and so on mm-hmm. but you never hear it is being mentioned in any discussions in nutrition in all the webinars <laughs> Because, because yeah i think we should i i think covid has really in the uk at least uh, where i currently is there's a lot of discussion about schools and closing schools and crashes and how our parents going to work and all the yeah. mental health i mean in general it's difficult to work yeah. right you have a 2 year old crawling you know going around in the house for you to for 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 us to have and 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 it's the time of reckoning in terms of affordable child care and um in in the uk and and to think that we are just starting that discussion uh, or not even enough is is somewhat telling and and thank you for bringing that up um i know that we are running short of time and there are questions so punima i'm going to take this opportunity of this di- of what prashant mentioned which is about district mineral fund and maybe reflect maybe i'm putting you on the spot and it's <laughs> if others can uh, also interject that's fine on in a bit, you know financing and what are some of the ways in which we should think about um you know um budgets and 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 financing of nutrition uh, that would be that would be great that would be my last point of discussion and i would really like to take questions which are again a lot on sam actually <laughs> yeah yeah uh, thanks sunita so um you know first i i just want to say one thing and then i'll talk about the financing so i i think it's yeah. very easy for people in policy spaces especially when you look at the numbers to forget that every number is a person is a child growing up in a family uh, that has to care for that child and what i find disturbing is that there is so much discussion about children and so little discussion about supporting families i mean have we does the state really think that you can care for 27 million children all by yourself no those 27 million children grow up in 27 million families this is the, the birth cohort by the way um the annual birth cohort of india is around 25 million and so our the approach needs to be focused very much more on family support what is it that the families in which children are growing up in need as opposed to what can we do to solve you know the child's problem the child's problem is the family's problem and somehow people you know don't want to necessarily talk about that right so so i think really the maternity benefits are part of that the pds is part of that getting the rega benefits to poor rural families is part of that kind of family support and so maybe one of the things that we need to do is to, is to really come together and say what is the kind of family support package that it would take that we think can can and should reach every single family in the first 1000 days uh and what are the numbers behind that and then put the cost to it right so we've done this for the core portion of bhan interventions we haven't done it for the support intervention so with uh my wonderful colleagues and collaborators apni kapoor and um 
adequate sh shukla we've uh, put together the cost of you know what should the budget be if you want to deliver everything that is articulated in the portion of hand package to the coverage levels that you want to deliver it to and you know 100% is the coverage levels we estimated. So those costs, those costs are available. There are other colleagues, you know, once the budget numbers are announced, there are a lot of other colleagues who will look at that and say, okay, how does what has been allocated actually align to what, you know, some of us have estimated is needed. This still doesn't include any kind of estimate of, you know, what should a family support budget look like for nutrition, right? Um, how much more do you need to put in place to, for example, make sure that the family is not food insecure or that they receive, you know, for example, we estimate that off, say we, we do an estimate of, okay, of the 25 million or so birth cohort of the year, you know, 10 million of them are going to be born in poor families that should be eligible for Norega benefits. What is that going to cost? You know, are we going to be able to put some numbers to that? So I think the work on costing and financing for nutrition has certainly begun and has been going on uh, for the last few years uh, in India, but it's been very focused on the on the nutrition specific interventions that are delivered by ICDS and, and health. We've included in that the costing of PMMBY also, uh, but I think it would be, you know, it's a good time to kind of widen the circle a little bit and say, okay, children grow in families and if you want families to be supported so they can take care of their children maybe this is the way we should think about a child budget so a child budget should not be just for what happens inside the ICPS it has to be a child friendly budget would also support the mothers of those children and the parents of those children so that's i think what i'd like to see i mean i i think i'll go back to um, you know abhi and colleagues and see you know, with all the rest of the amazing financing work they do, how can we maybe draw some interesting yeah. circles here to further that that discussion? Um, but yeah, otherwise, you know, I, I think all of us will be spending even more time continuing on the, you know, the analysis and interpretations. There's still a lot to be learned, a lot of data that's missing. I'm very troubled by the fact that we have no economic data that's, you know, that tells us what has happened properly mm -hmm. to to poverty and to the poorest in the last several years. So there's lots of things to patch together. <laughs> and so I hope we can do some of that uh, together with, you know, with, uh, with Jean and Prashanta, Aryan, like with everybody in the room, because together we are stronger. Um, okay, so it would be remiss of me to have an economist or not ask him to input into that question. So Jean, um, anything you want to add on on financing part of nutrition um, to, in addition to what Purnima said. What would you like to see in the budget, upcoming budget, for example, next week? Well, I would certainly see, like to see a fair amount of money for reviving these programs which have been undermined during yeah. the lockdown and of course even more during the lockdown. Uh, it's interesting what you said about the fact that there's a lot of discussion at your end about the uh, you know, the plight of children and how to reopen the schools and so on and the crashes. And here there's hardly any discussion of this. And in fact, it's amazing how little attention has been paid to the children during, throughout uh, 2020. Uh, the yeah. and the schools were closed without batting an eyelid. And although there were some symbolic efforts to still reach some uh, substitutes for mid days or cash or something, they, they were kind of quite haphazard efforts, not very effective because partly because there was no system in place for it. But overall, very little effort to protect children from the consequences of the lockdown. So I think it's really urgent now to revive all these services, the schools, the anybodies, the health centers, and to put the money and the political backing uh, behind all this. Let me quickly say something about ICDS because, you know, uh, <laughs> You said, you, you, you gave the impression that, may, that maybe we think too much about, um, about ICDS. But you know, it's not just another scheme. Uh, ICDS, or, or rather the Anganadi, the, the Child Care Center, it's not a scheme, it's an institution. You know, it's like the school for the children, right. in the age group of 6 to 14. Whatever you want to do, uh, that is the way to reach them. You reach the children in the age group of 6 to 14 through the schools, and you reach the youngest children through the Anganadi. So uh, nobody is saying that the ICDS scheme is fine as it is. 
uh, that is not what I meant to say when I said that uh, we should go deeper into the box rather than uh, reinvent the wheel. Uh, a lot of things can be built around ICDS, but I think as a basic institutional foundation, it is mm -hmm. not bad. In fact, it is reaching even the remotest parts of the country and it is quite functional. It is one of the most functional schemes. I think it's probably more functional than many schools in those areas and certainly yeah. much more functional than the health sub-center. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an institutional foundation on which a lot of, a lot of things can be built. And we have it, we really have to give it a lot of importance. I would say it's the scheme that should be given the most importance uh, by the government mm -hmm. of India. And in fact, in reality, it's the reverse. It's the lowest priority. And uh, for example, uh, Women and Child Development Secretary in many states, like here in Jharkhand, you know, it's considered as a kind of punishment posting uh, instead of, uh, you know, an opportunity yeah. to. Uh, uh, the yeah. work uh, of uh, tremendous uh, value. Mm. Yeah. No, your point is well taken. I didn't mean to uh, say that ICDS is not important. My my point was to open the box to we cannot put en the entire onus on any one institution. Just like we can't put entire onus on just the crashes or just the food Se national food security act. It was uh, perhaps uh, did not come up, um, but thanks for pointing that out, and I stand corrected on that. Um, we just need to do better ICDS and more than ICDS was my uh, point in terms of uh, enabling uh, families and communities to uh, to uh, to nourish themselves and their children. I mean, in India, we, we do believe that it takes a village to raise a child, and I think we should just really take that to heart when when really crafting these programs. Um, um, that doesn't mean with enough resources, of course, I'm not just saying, oh, you know, just do this in thin air in communities at the grassroots level. Um, hopefully, let's wait with a bated breath on what the budget says, um, and hopefully we will not be too disappointed, but who knows. Um, so with that, I really do have to uh, bring uh, to conclusion this discussion. I have a Q&A, so maybe let me ask a few questions, and I think some of these questions uh, were answered in the process of our conversation. So I hope I don't have to go step by step. But if you can just keep your answers also a bit uh, sharp and short, that will be, um, be super. I don't want to um, not ask some of these questions. One of the questions by Suhas Chen, Subhash Chen sorry, is uh, by, about biofortified uh, food. And if you add to the diet of the pregnant women and children below age of 14 years, uh, the problem of malnutrition may be solved. Um, Aryan, do you want to take that um, um, question? Um, Biofortified crops, where are we? I mean, are we producing enough to I, include that I must at know, this point? I must, I must not admit, I know very little about uh, the coverage, what is happening in the council on that one. So maybe one of the other colleagues. Punima, if Pri does a lot of work. Yeah. Of so <laughs> biofortification has been acknowledged as a potential contribution of the, um, you know, the agriculture sector. I, I think, again, you know, we come back to these issues of necessary but not sufficient. You know, they can add some nutrients into the diets that, that are missing and that can be bred into these crops. Are they going to solve, you know, the entire problem of malnutrition? No. Are they going to contribute towards that? Yes. Are they reaching? Right now, I, you know, I think the Ministry of Agriculture has, um, I think sometime last year, announced quite a range of crops that they're integrating uh, traditional biofortification, traditional breeding based biofortification into. So, you know, but as you and I both know, Sunita, the chain from getting something into getting a biofortified crop to actually having it go into the markets and into, you know, people's, um, you know, plates uh, is a long journey. So um, we should try everything. You know, I, I'm at this point, you know, I, I I, I'm upset about the quest for single solutions. I feel like, you know, one should be trying everything that is possible to try within the available budgets and available implementation mechanisms and doing those things well. Pressing all the buttons for long enough Pressing all, yeah, one exactly. Of things that, uh, you know, uh, nutritionists working on multi-sectional interventions have yeah. been seen, yeah. Um, uh, Jean, this is to you, I know you have to leave soon, is from Sirisha. The question is for Jean, sir. Uh, if you look at the poorest quintiles, the drop in all three indicators of malnutrition, the decline is very slow when compared to other quintiles. 
is correcting in income inequality the only way to address this? What could be the other ways to tackle them? And also, <coughs> other than PPC, there hasn't been many programs launched considering that malnutrition is multifactorial. Sirisha, we did talk several of the multifactorial questions, but can you tell us about income inequality? Sorry, uh, was this based on the NFHS 5 data? Uh, I don't know. Sirisha, do you want to say if we look at the poorest quintiles, the drop in all three indicators? I don't think that NFHS 5 did this by quintiles. Yes, I uh, from NFHS 4, she says in the chat. And a trend from Trend from one NFHS to another NFHS had shown that the drop was quite flat if you look at the poorest country. Yeah. So is income inequality the main do is addressing in, income inequality the main main way to correct this? Well, I think, you know, as Aryan rightly said earlier, I mean undernutrition has a lot of determinants, you know, it's a matter of food, it's a matter of diversity of mm. diet, it's a matter of sanitation, clean water, healthcare, uh, gender uh, equality, uh, and of course also economic inequality. So I think, of course, if we can reduce inequality, and especially in the form of uh, supporting the incomes of poor people, that will have an impact. But, you know, economic inequality is also a big problem of, problem of its own. It's a much larger problem in terms of economic problem. And, uh, for example, taxing the rich, I would say, is a very important way of reducing economic inequality. But that will not do much to improve the nutrition of the children, unless, of course, you use the taxes to uh, yeah. spend on the yeah. program of uh, CDS, which I would, of course, favor very much. So I would say there's an overlap between the issue of economic inequality and the issue of child nutrition, but both of them also have many, many other aspects. Right. Thank you so much. And there is, I guess it's addressed to you from Abhijit because it's about well, the paper, you, one of the papers you've written many years ago. How can you explain the falling calorie consumption alongside increasing underweight and stunting rates? Oh, okay. Is calorie <laughs> consumption still going down? Yeah, you might want you know, to. No, that it's, that you're right. Exactly. Uh, it's part of the answer. <laughs> no, first of all, uh, it's also not true, I think, that the stunting and underweight is increasing. In the last five years, of course, in some states, it has increased a little bit, and overall, there's a kind of stagnation pattern. Stagnation, but yeah. The, but the evidence on calorie uh, decline, that was much earlier. That was until, I think, 2009, 10. It was late or something, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And after that, I would expect it to stop. And in fact, if you compare 2009, 10, and 11, 12, uh, there was a marginal increase, I think, in average calorie consumption. Yeah. So there yeah. was a period of time when uh, average calorie consumption was declining. The anthropometric indi indicators at that time were improving, not, not deteriorating. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, there's a puzzle why would uh, calorie intake decreasing, decrease at the time of economic growth and of increasing people's incomes? And there has been, there have been various hypotheses on that. Uh, uh, but I think that's really not, a, not true anymore. Uh, one hypothesis, of course, among others, was that in that period, there was some reduction in uh, calorie requirements because of the, of the increase in activity, you know, because for example, yeah. they used to fetch water from a long distance, they used to use these hand uh, flour mm -hmm. chakis that were extremely, uh, took a lot of energy. So it's possible that with mechanization and so on and better travel facilities and yeah. other factors, there was some, some reduction in, in activity levels and yeah. Calorie requirements. There are also other hypotheses, uh, and there's a long more debate about this. But yeah. uh, I don't think it would be true anymore that uh, calorie consumption is. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I must say that average calorie consumption, to my mind, is not a very interesting indicator of nutrition. Uh, it doesn't correlate very well whether it's over time or whether it's across mm -hmm. uh, states of India, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. with more direct indicators of nutrition like child, child anthropometry. Uh, and, oh, yeah. uh, and a lot of variations, as we all know, uh, in, between persons in calorie requirements. I mean, some people look quite well on low calorie intake and some people need a huge calorie intake. So mm -hmm. until, you know, until you know the joint distribution you know? of intake and requirements, you really can't infer very much yeah. from mm -hmm. average calorie intake in the population. Yeah, so I think you know we have played, we have uh, perhaps uh, spent too much time on these calorie indicators, and we should focus more on the outcomes of interest 
namely nutrition and also health. Yeah. I apologize, I'm I have to leave now because I have to catch a bus. But <laughs> All right, bye. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. We are almost coming to an end. Um, uh, just adding to that point, there are lots of questions. I'm sorry, we are, will not be able to take many of them, but I hope, except for this one question on Aadhaar, the um, rest of them, unfortunately, Jean left, and he's a person who probably would have loved to talk about it. Uh, there's a question on Aadhaar and whether it's going to deliver Aadhaar integrated, um, Aadhaar integrated interventions would result in uh, exclusion or inclusion kind of thing. So that's for another day. They just have to read your read your writings, I suppose. No, I'll just say in two sentences, Aadhaar should not be have anything to do with program, children's programs. And in fact, it's, it's against the Supreme Court order. The Supreme Court said very clearly that uh, school admission, admission to Angaradi's child education services, yeah. all these should be exempt from Aadhaar. And in spite of that, Aadhaar is still de facto being treated as mandatory, certainly in Jharkhand, for most of these programs. Yeah. So I think you know, that's really not the way to go. And now I really have to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. I, I actually don't know, we have one minute now. So sorry, I, I will not actually wrap up or anything because everyone has been so involved. It's been a great conversation. I, I invite uh, Ashmita Gupta to now give a uh, word of thanks to all the panelists. I'm sorry to rush and, and do a shorty job of thanking all our panelists, but thank you so much. Thanks to all the panelists for having such a wonderful discussion on malnutrition. I think it is one of the biggest uh, problems that, that our society is facing. And uh, you touched upon all the things from gender to budgeting to calorie intake in the end. Uh, children, family needs, everything was, um, uh, it was really stimulating, although I, I had to go on and off in between due to various reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, to some extent, like uh, for those of us who have been interested in the growth process uh, or have been studying the growth process of India, uh, they, they had seen this coming because the growth uh, uh, that uh, was witnessed in the GDP, we didn't see a commensurate expansion in the manufacturing sector and uh, it was also leading to increasing in inequality. So uh, I think that uh, this topic is very important and that's why Adri and our IGC brought together all the eminent panelists and I thank on their behalf everyone for coming here and having such a wonderful discussion today. Thank you.